俺の財宝が欲しけりゃくれてやる探せこの世の全てをそこに置いてきた If you haven't seen One Piece up to the Reverie arc, you might want to turn away and familiarize yourself with the complete story. If not, then prepare for me to do the honors whilst arguing that this series is genius. So, yeah, let's dive in. The reason this isn't a 10 minute and 1 second video like everything else on this channel is because of one simple fact <laughs> it's pretty big. One Piece is steadily approaching 100 volumes and 1000 chapters of length, with no ending in sight. Despite the length, this is an analysis of just a few streaks of gold from this series that I feel contributes to its perceived quality the most. This, of course, cannot include absolutely everything in One Piece, but nor can any video I would posit. This video relies more so on how Aichiro Oda constructs this series with a focus on character analysis and its closeness to the overarching themes of the franchise. I hope to really get into the nitty gritty of why people love this series to the point of literally letting a door fall on top of them so that they can carry on watching. What the so grab a snack, turn down the lights, and enjoy the genius of One Piece. From the very start, East Blue is a slow, if deliberate, introduction to pretty much everything that One Piece would later become. Say what you will about certain members of the Straw Hat Pirates at this point, but Luffy in particular is one of the most lovable characters in not just the series, but in anime altogether. For a child who simply wants to become the Pirate King, Luffy has an extremely sound morality and care for those around him. Luffy's mentality, his desire for a crew or Nakama, and his carefree but considerate personality are all shaped from his childhood. It's appropriate then that we start with a flashback of Shanks. Shanks loses his arm to save Luffy from a monster. The peculiarity of this flashback comes primarily from Shanks' reaction to this. Shanks saves Luffy with a smile on his face. The chivalrous impression of his heroism is burned into Luffy's mind. As signified by an intricate and beautiful still of the two floating in the water. It's an image, the first of the whole series, that is designed to stand out and stay in the reader's mind for a long time. It's no coincidence then that this is where Luffy receives his signature straw hat. It's because this is where everything that makes Luffy Luffy begins. Monkey D. Luffy's crew could have just as easily been called the Monkey Pirates, and Oda could have just made some equally dumb joke about it. But that isn't our starting point. This is the story of the Straw Hat Pirates and Luffy's heroic character modeled appropriately from the man who saved him as a child. Luffy's tears and screams of concern are endearing, as it conveys a shock and awe that would concentrate into a subconscious idolization of Shanks. The unquestioning urge to jump in and help those lacking in power is something that would go on to become a defining trait of Luffy's character, and is also something rooted in this moment. In a way, one could say that Luffy answers his own questions by living up to this idea of a stoic pirate, by courageously marching on with the true spirit of one. Appropriately, this scene touches on the same feeling of bittersweet heroism echoed within Luffy's pivotal actions throughout the series. Be it whilst trying to retain everybody in his crew, or losing members of this crew, half of the emotional moments in this series aren't focused on loss, but instead are focused on the realization of sentimentality that we hold towards the things and people around us. This is the spirit of Luffy, and by extension, this is also the spirit of One Piece. Losing an arm is naturally a traumatic and negative thing to happen to anyone, and yet, Shanks laughs. The freedom that comes with being a pirate has afforded Shanks a happiness that allows him to smile even through these moments. Luffy is taught the value of being a pirate through Shanks' happiness. One Piece instantly differentiates itself from about 90% of manga and anime by stating the value of the journey before taking us on it, and only stands as strong as it does because Oda has stuck with this concept and has gone on to display it in fresh ways for so incredibly long. One Piece relies so heavily on the humor that it has for the very purpose of blindsiding us with these moments of realization for all of the people that we've grown to love. This element even crosses over into the artwork with a lack of realistic anatomy and over exaggerated designs for pretty much every single character. 
Aichiro Oda's choice in colour palettes and fondness for brush pens adds to an aesthetic that makes One Piece almost look like a children's picture book. And it's quite possibly done to accentuate these moments of real, raw emotion that he delivers in a sublime way. Because when they arrive, they hit hard. In Alabaster, when we see Luffy's brother Ace helping out, or when one of the Baroque Works agents turns sides, we're slowly adjusted to the realisation that we aren't simply rooting for the Straw Hat Pirates, but for this idea of Luffy's that harkens back to his humble origins. Luffy appropriately phrases the people that are good in his eyes as Nakama. This is less of a formality from Luffy, and more of a descriptor towards people who embody this idealism that pertains back to this impressionistic moment in his life. These Nakama can be just about anybody and aren't exclusive to potential crewmates. For example, in the underground prison of Impel Down, we have the guarded fortress that houses some of the most diabolical and heinous criminals, and in this dark, putrid corner of the world, there is still some hope. Prisoners naturally have no freedom, but in Impel Down, many suffer from inhumane levels of neglect and even torture. Impel Down is this bleak, inhospitable prison where people are stripped of not only their freedom, but their dignity. In spite of this, some are given a small amount of freedom back into their lives through the prisoner, Ivankov. Ivankov is a drag queen who possesses gender-transforming hormones. Prisoners are given a small injection of freedom into their lives through the choice to live exactly as they please, and in a life of luxury so long as they respect the people who reside there. To see such a happy and carefree counterbalance to this within the prison itself makes Ivankov one of the most uplifting characters in the whole series, and it's an obvious fit to the kind of person that Luffy looks up to. Both are coincidentally two of Oda's most favourite characters. The quality that they both share is a profound sense of humanity. The humanising quality to some characters is what makes One Piece so touching. You have the world government, this entity that's in place to maintain order and unify the world. At first glance, you'd expect them to be the protagonists of the story, but this isn't the case. At the centre of their power lies the detestable celestial dragons, who enslave and abuse whoever they please. Their deplorable characteristics and their proneness to murder and defilement embody order to an extreme. It makes the chaos that comes with the Great Pirate Era seem like a fairer place to live. A large part of why this is, is because of the spirit of Luffy. Almost like Vash the Stampede bringing love and peace to a place where people's hearts are all dried up, Luffy's infectious personality rubs off on everybody around him, extending to the world leaders, the revolutionaries, the world government officials, and even eventually a celestial dragon. For such a cheerful and carefree world, it can't be changed overnight and can only hope for better by leaving no stone unturned when it comes to progress. This element of Luffy's character is intertwined with the world building by having the world progressively move away from these corrupted systems with a cast of characters that change for the better after having experienced this spirit firsthand. Blackbeard and the Blackbeard Pirates, the rival pirate crew of the series, impose a polar opposite to the Straw Hat crew through an opposition to their idea of Nakama and of their spirit of adventure. Blackbeard and his crew live for materialistic goals, power and plundering more so than anything else. When stood up to by powerful enemies, they snivel in fear, resort to cheap shots, and rely upon underhanded tactics to ensure that they come out on top. The introductory scene for Blackbeard almost sets him up as a supporting character, with a jovial eagerness that matches Luffy's. But if we look a little closer, there is also a clear focus on pitting these two against each other with a determinable line that only grows wider and wider as time elapses. There's a video by Furfy vs Anime on the scene that dissects it really well, uh, the link to which is in the description below. Uh, also subscribe to him, he's really good, and it's genuine sin that he doesn't have more subscribers. But anyway. One Piece is definitely not a series where people typically die. However, there are two instances of death perhaps even its two most important, that directly affect not only Luffy, but the whole world. I am of course talking about the death of Fire Fist Ace, and of Edward Newgate, famously named Whitebeard. It is vital to note that these are not only the two deaths that are the most important to the series, but that these are the only two events in the entire story that completely quash any hope of this pre-established spirit. Furthermore, the strongest link in setting this all up is none other than Blackbeard. By taking Ace hostage and delivering him into the lap of the marines, Blackbeard, or Marshal D. Teach, pushes the hand of the Whitebeard pirates to make a move, pitting everybody against everybody to serve nobody's interests aside from his own. Blackbeard has come far in the Great Pirate Age, 
making a name for himself as one of the Yonko, and obtaining one of the most powerful Devil Fruits in existence, whilst also discovering a method to maintain two Devil Fruits at once. On paper, he is exactly how he wants you to think. A strong, up-and-coming warlord who is capable of getting anything that he wants. But in truth, Blackbeard is certainly a swashbuckling pirate, but is one that does so with no discrepancy. Similarly to the Celestial Dragons living up to an idea of order taken too far, Blackbeard is an example of an opportunist who lives up to this through such an extent that he more comparably resembles the idea of chaos taken too far. Pitting everyone against each other so that he can take a devil fruit from somebody's corpse, and calling himself victorious despite constantly surviving by the skin of his teeth, Teach is a hack. Despite so many good people dying, and so many tyrants living on and perpetuating the state of the world, it's important to remember that One Piece does show that the world is capable of change. The only man who can change this world of order to an extreme is one who has fully embraced freedom. Similarly to how Shanks imbued a sense of what it meant to be a pirate by smiling at his freedoms and the ability to use it for good, Luffy uses his freedom to leave a lasting impression that stays with the people he meets and affects them in the exact same way that he was left in. It's a very Japanese spirituality that, as its main undercurrent, probably alienates a lot of Western audience when considering that other big entries don't have this. Oda once said, Luffy believes that the Pirate King is the person with the most freedom in the world. On the other hand, Luffy always acts on behalf of others. He finds it cool to help people in front of him. Making others happy makes him happy. And then, those he helped return the favor. I believe that this samurai spirit, a chivalrous heart that beats for others, should be passed down to future generations. Perhaps that is the mystery of D. Those born with the D initial in their names are a part of a larger mystery in the world of One Piece. They seem to be able to affect world events on a global scale, be it for freedom or personal gain. They have a tendency to die with a smile on their face. Almost conversely to the existence of the Celestial Dragons, perhaps the Will of D is a group of people imbued with the freedom to forge their own destinies and imbue others around them with this freedom for better or worse. All of this chapter so far has focused on character development in the series, and it's honestly one of the reasons why One Piece is as good as it is. Aichiro Oda once wanted the series to last for five years, and be structured like an RPG game. He quickly came to the realization that he couldn't do it with this timescale in a convincing manner. Initially, I thought about modeling the crewmate gathering process after those video games where the enemy joins your team once you defeat them. But after having serious talks with other people, I realized that if some kid were to suddenly come up to me and say, let's just become pirates, I wouldn't agree. Unless he had a compelling story, I wouldn't join his crew. In the beginning, I plan to assemble a crew of 10 within the first year and a half. After 20 years, the story is about 80% complete, yet there are still only nine crewmates. By taking the long route, Oda has made a pretty big chore for himself, but has left us with an epic that has a plethora of genuine characters that intertwine in a genius method, and they all connect back to the spirit of Luffy. A great deal of the world building in One Piece comes from the pre-established dynamic of different characters. We learn a lot of things through flashbacks and the traumas that people face. Dealing with the past is a common byproduct of this. As established before, Luffy deals with the past by living up to his ideal of becoming King of the Pirates. But there are others in his crew that have a similar story arc. Similar to how East Blue acts as a kind of prototype for the rest of the series but displays some rough edges because of it, the Fishman Island arc is a comparative prototype for what the second half of the series would later deal with. Although an elusive detail to pick up on, a big part of the second half of One Piece has been about dealing with the lack of parental figures. As queen of the Ryugu Kingdom, Otohime was the mother of Shirahoshi and wife to King Neptune. Her main goal as sovereign was to unite the people of Fishman Island with those on land. Migration laws and growing tensions between both sides were the main struggling issues to arise in her reign, and ended up being the source of her untimely death. When Luffy and Co arrive, they find a land of people hopeless for the future of foreign relations and haunted by the death of Otohime. It takes the Straw Hats unearthing this whole plot by a fisherman who orchestrated Otohime's death for the royal family to join their cause and rethink their stance on the future. They finally deal with their pasts by having Otohime's murderer deal with the consequences to his actions. Hoodie Jones is the first villain in One Piece to be autonomous. 
where we've had an opportunist, a lawman, and a really, really irritating frogman, we've always had antagonists that act in very straightforward manners. Their backstories and their personal beliefs aren't important so much as their everyday actions and standings. With Hody Jones, we begin the second half of the series with a villain that has a cause that he believes is greater than himself, that he genuinely wants to achieve at the expense of his own life. I could fish for more meanings in this arc, but honestly, it's a simple arc that doesn't do much aside from setting this new pattern of storytelling up for the reader and or watcher. The series would go on to explore characters that deal with traumatic pasts which, more often than not, involve the loss of a parent like this. Punk Hazard and Dressrosa finally clarify the Don Quixote family who have been in the background all the way back since the Alabaster arc. At a young age, two brothers are forced to live a normal life due to their father's decision to denounce themselves from their status of Celestial Dragons. When the public refuse to accept them back into society and ostracize them for their reputations, Doflamingo begins to resent his father for his bad decision making and resents him further for crawling back to the Celestial Dragons when he begs for their return. Things begin to spiral out of control when Doffy does the unexpected and kills his father before using it as a bargaining chip to re-enter the dragons by himself, beginning his rogue life of heartless brutality. Doflamingo is named after a Spanish novel aptly named The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, though Doflamingo is actually a clear twist on this classic tale in some regards. The book details the story of a noble called Alonso Quijano, who becomes so enamoured by the idea of romanticised heroism that he becomes this idea and lives through the world as a knight errant named Don Quixote, a travelling hero who lives for the very notion of chivalry. That descriptor sounds completely off base for the kind of person that Doffy is, and you'd be right to think so. In the book, Alonso Quijano is a man who suffers from severe sleeping issues. Regularly reading books instead of sleeping is alluded to be the reason behind the illusions of grandeur he undergoes that would lead to him assuming the identity of Don Quixote. These are both characters that are heavily influenced by what's in front of them. Be it lack of power or a heroic tale, both characters are people who get too far ahead of themselves and let it snowball to the point of rejecting their actual lives. You could say that Alonso Quijano rejected his everyday life in favour of this mystical, heroic life that he could only ever yearn for through stories. You could also say that Doffy started with his idyllic lifestyle and conversely yearned for nothing at all. When this is taken away from him, his quest isn't for heroism, but simply for himself. Rosinante is the name of the horse that Alonso Quijano would ride on his conquest to become this figure, and Rosinante is also the younger brother who Doffy kills in order to maintain his position. Both are used as vehicles for the character in question to further their goals and can be seen as a great anchor for where the true differences lie in the inspiration for this story. From here, Oda takes some interesting choices of his own for these two. Giving Rosinante the ability to close off areas of sound is an interesting addition to the distance that he has from his brother and his choice to remain silent it's indicative of his perceptive and thoughtful personality. Giving Doffy the ability of caging things even to the level of a grand scale is actually indicative of his shrinking mentality when it comes to control and manipulation that he maintains over not only his brother, but to everyone around him. Closing people off from one another and playing with everyone like strings on a puppet, Doffy is yet another without a parental figure that met his undoing not just from Luffy, but Trafalgar D. Law a man who was screwed over by the actions of the Celestials, but who survived only thanks to Rosinante undoing this at the cost of his life. Doffy, whilst certainly cartoony, is a further departure from the One Piece of old, as he furthers the development of villains born from circumstance. Whilst it was his own evil actions that caused misery and his lack of remorse that makes him detestable, his backstory certainly gives us a lot to chew on. He isn't so much an orchestrator as much as he is a cog in the machine, a player in a bigger game which he only wanted to play because it was taken away from him. He isn't held down by duty or law, but by his past. It's the second case of this happening in One Piece, and it certainly won't be the last. Whole Cake Island is a fantastic arc to analyse when it comes to this, though this arc would deal more exclusively with mother figures. Through one flashback, we learn that Sanji was the neglected child of the highly militarised family, the Vinsmokes, a family which forced their children to become soldiers. Sanji never really lived up to this goal and always wanted to be a chef, constantly disobeying his father and cooking for his increasingly sick mother. He's really bad at it, by the way. It's his mother who smiles and reinforces the only sense of accomplishment to Sanji that he experiences in his whole childhood. When his mother does die, 
it is the beginning of Sanji's road to independence, to go off and leave the Vinsmirks. It should be clear to see that Sanji has dealt with his past by treating women with the utmost respect, and by honing his skills as a chef. Two attitudes that he was trained to lessen and forget about altogether. Sanji was always enamoured by his ability to please his mother, and by looking at this stoic and cold reception that his other family members hold, it's clear to see why he became the obsessive man that he is today. Cooking food and compassion are in and of themselves two traits that many people would identify as a feminine, womanly trait. This is of course a stereotype that originates from a traditionalist viewpoint, and is coincidentally one that closely ties together with the kind of person that Vince Smoke Judge is. That the boys should be raised to be soldiers, and that Reiju is weak as a female, and should be shunned because of it. Like a bloodhound, he spots the weakest link, and approves of compounding a sense of worthlessness into Sanji because of it. It appropriately should be noted that Reiju is the only other member of the Vinsmokes aside from Sanji that possesses a caring personality. This is cleverly written by Oda as well, because the Vinsmokes are never championed as heroes or as humble in any way. That's Sanji's role, and to an extent, as the only one who cares, it's Reiju's role as well. But it's a great characterization in Sanji that he bonds with his sister again, because despite worrying about Sanji but maintaining her distance as a child, Reiju has grown into a woman who shows the same level of respect and care for Sanji as their loving mother did. Despite the both of them being taught not to indulge in anything but stoic warmongering, Sanji and Reiju have developed into independent people who choose to fully embrace themselves, even if this went against the goals of the family. This is all from the past, and we already know what kind of person Sanji grows into, so it isn't too much of a surprise to see Sanji's eagerness when forced to wed Charlotte Pudding, one of the many children of Charlotte Linlin, otherwise known as Big Mom. Pudding is this sweet, shy, if stereotypical, girl with a crush for Sanji who loves him and loves baking and loves stereotypically girly things and yeah, match made in heaven, right? Well, no, she's actually this twisted, sadistic, fake manipulating succubus who wants to kill Sanji as part of her mother's plans to wipe out the Vinsmokes altogether. Pudding is a single part of this matriarchy run by Big Mom a vast family of people that rule over an entire island under the ruthlessness of the matriarch herself. Big Mom is a flippant leader, who won't bat an eyelid at the prospect of exiling or murdering her children if under the right circumstances. It's easy to understand then that Big Mom is also someone who will insult and resent her children for things beyond their own control. With no need to explain, this is an extremely toxic trait that manifests itself into the whole family from mannerisms to ambitions. I could make a small case study of each person if I felt like it and fill an hour of video talking about that alone, but if we just focus on Pudding for a second, we can decipher that she wants an escape from this. Despite feeling compelled to kill Sanji, she loses this power when he compliments her hidden third eye, something that Big Mom had belittled her about from childhood. This kindness is a show of affection from the normal Sanji that we already know and love, but to Pudding? This is a form of affection that she was not only neglected of, but chided for. She later struggles between trying to antagonize Sanji and trying not to fall for him. It's played off for comedic effect rather well, but it conveys the plight of Pudding's backstory with sublime elegance. So why is this family so big and where did this all start? To take a look at that, we need to in turn look at the big baddie herself, Big Mom. As a child with a voracious appetite, Lin Lin was someone who struggled to live among others. Abandoned by her parents, she was one of the few to be looked after by Mother Carmel, one of the most loving people in the whole world who was notorious for her caring and considerate personality. Despite this, it doesn't take Carmel long to realize that regardless of her innocent personality, Lin Lin has a powerful temperament within her that, when combined with her unusually strong physique, presents an overwhelming threat to those around her. Causing multiple instances of tension over her inability to fast, Lin Lin is hated by the giants and other children when she goes on a spree of unconscious violence and refuses to settle until fed. Carmel eventually agrees to sell Lin Lin to Cypher Paul, giving up on her duties of a renowned mother figure, but not before one final party. One final party in which Lin Lin's appetite consumes her once more. When she awakens, everybody is gone. The presentation of this backstory is so upsetting to watch and clash with Lin Lin's childhood innocence. Even as an adult, Lin Lin brandishes a picture of Mother Carmel on her desk, a sign of continuing love. Though Lin Lin makes a large case for a woman with a troubled past, she has tendencies which resemble eating disorders, episodes of amnesia, and a wrath that is irrational and all-encompassing. 
The reason behind this is that Lin Lin has repressed these memories of trauma, and despite having made something of herself, she hasn't dealt with her very real problems. So much is this the case that when Luffy smashes Carmel's photograph, unaware of its significance, it fully unleashes the pent-up feelings from Lin Lin. Like panic or anxiety, this manic anger is something that fully encompasses Lin Lin's body, thoughts, and actions. Her children scuttle around, trying to calm her down to no avail, whilst total war breaks out against those involved. It's easy to blame Big Mom for the way in which some of her children have grown, but at the same time, it's unfair to blame her for everything, considering the abandonment she had faced in such a manipulated world. Though it's a near full circle to the second half of the series' approach to storytelling, we clearly aren't quite there just yet. But Whole Cake Island brings more things to a close than any arc preceding it. Inspiration is a healthy thing for any artist. As a writer, your favourite elements of different series can factor in as a huge reason why you'd want to do something alike in your own way. Putting a different spin on things and following different archetypical stories isn't inherently bad. It all depends on how well it is executed. I think One Piece simply does this better than anything else in Shonen Jump. There are so many layers of inspiration from all kinds of different shonen and Japanese mediums that it's almost preposterous to list these elements and say to yourself that this is the number one manga in the world? And yet it is. I'd posit that the biggest reason why it is, is because of how well it takes inspiration and redelivers it into its own story, but in a refreshing way. A big source of the flame wars between fans of popular shonen jump manga has always been X series is copying X series, and here's why. Well, here's the thing. Nothing is copying anything in Shonen Jump, but if we're using the word copying, just don't. It's called inspiration. I think it's worth noting again that it takes an absurdly long amount of time before the series finds anything close to the level of quality that it would come to be known for. The power system isn't even prevalent for the first half of the series. It's there, technically speaking, but it simply isn't being utilised at all. Things slowly come into being, and then, long after the seeds are planted, Oda comes and reaps the harvest when the time is just right. By not making anything too clear from the offset, it makes it impossible to tell if One Piece was planned from the very beginning and lends itself to a very intricate and slow style of storytelling. Similar to Gintama, the pacing of One Piece isn't exactly glacial, things are happening all the time, every single page. But what makes the series seem so slow, especially at the beginning, is through what it chooses to focus on, which is to say, mostly the crew. However, the story isn't exclusive to them, the world changes from arc to arc, and off-screen occurrences happen for even some of the biggest fights in the series. Think Ace vs Blackbeard, Akainu vs Sengoku, or even Shanks vs Whitebeard. It might occasionally seem like nothing happens in the bigger picture at all, but this is a clever method of storytelling that ensures that Oda tells the story of the Straw Hat Pirates primarily, and tells the story of an ever-changing world with plenty of interesting plot points and given plenty of time. It's easier to see it through the perspective of narrative arcs, but it does so in a multi-layered kind of sense. It has smaller intervallic arcs that detail the Straw Hat's adventure, and in the background there is an even bigger narrative arc which encompasses the world behind them, and is increasingly moved and affected by the smaller ripples that the numerous smaller arcs make. A tougher way of looking at it is to look at the official arc map. Look at this, we have chapters, and the chapters make an arc, and then the arcs make a saga, and then the sagas make a bigger saga, and then the both of these sagas are a part of some- oh, wait, that's the whole series. It uses longevity as a key to growth, ensuring that a convincing world is built over time. The structure of One Piece is less akin to a single three acts, but countless stories all following this dynamic that reinvent themselves or reboot themselves again and again and again, with a finale lying far out there on the horizon, where both of these arcs tie together in an ending. I realise that this sounds more like an apt comparison for most story arcs in manga and anime, but with One Piece, some of these stories are so self-contained and presented so differently from the last, especially when these story arcs have run through two decades of the manga industry, that the way One Piece is structured ends up being one of its most original traits. Tying itself closely with the passage of time, One Piece's structure isn't specifically continual or episodic, but more of a mix of these two elements at the same time on a much larger scale. 
The nature of this part of the series is reaffirmed by the fact that Oda has attested that he has written the entire series without knowing anything to come aside from the ending. To give you an exemplary quote from an interview by Viz, an interviewer once asked, To the reader, it's amazing to think about the fact that you had Brooke's story planned out when you first introduced the Laboon. Exactly how far ahead do you plan One Piece and what is your story planning technique? To which Oda replied, I only have the ending of One Piece in my mind, and nothing else. But knowing the ending point, I weave the story and make the story arcs that build up to it. This is certainly a method that many people employ to achieve a large scale world building. But Oda does this to also maintain a refreshing tone and feel to the manga every couple years. By switching between two dynamics, the Straw Hats and the World Officials, we have two stories that are ever changing. And that's without mentioning the fantastical elements of One Piece that shape its world. So even if we don't count the changes of perspective, we have a manga that has a more diverse set of arcs than anything out there. Literally, we have a couple regular arcs, an arc in the sky, haunted house arc, a battle arc, an underwater arc, an arctic arc, a confectionery arc, and a samurai arc. Could there be any more variety than that? This even goes hand in hand with the villains. You have a merman, a musical singing sweet aficionado for Whole Cake Island, and even a dragon for Wano. I genuinely don't think there is a more varied and out there series in the history of Shonen Jump. With longevity being the greatest strength, Oda knows how to pull this off to maximum effect and plays this up with different worlds every couple of years. And no two have been alike for the very purpose of keeping this structure solid, the variety strong, and the pacing steady. Longevity is a great strength, but it is also an inevitable weakness. The biggest downside to One Piece at this point is giving something this long this much of a chance in order to view entirely. The East Blue portion is of a low enough quality that you could easily see the hundreds of hours ahead as not worth watching. The series started almost an entire year before I was born, and I'm old now. Listen to this. You hear that? That's me scratching my beard. I have a beard now. When you go for a run as long as this, you're not just going to get complaints of pacing when it comes to an overarching storyline, but you're probably going to get some duds in there. Nobody can escape the eventual dud. Well, I mean, I guess some can. But just like Mecha Naruto or that ostrich, everybody will eventually crawl themselves into a bad bit of storytelling. Bruh, look at this dude. <laughs> Wait till you see the. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> For Oda, some of these aged really badly, like really, really badly. Long Ring Long Land, oh, how's that pronounced? Long Ring Long Land is just so bad. It's this competition with a bad pirate man and I, I, I actually barely remember, and I swear I looked this up again last night because the human mind just wants to purge this creature. It is so unbearable and annoying and 19 chapters long! If it had gone on any longer, it would have been releasing in the manga at the same time as the G8 arc. A filler arc that's actually really well done in the One Piece anime. Imagine that for a second. A bad One Piece manga at the same time as good One Piece anime filler. Unbelievable. If that's not a dud, then I don't know what is. Why are so many cool characters left to scream on them? Oh, like Vivi, I, I love you. I believe in your cause, but good god, stop screaming. Why the running jokes never change? They're just recycled again and again and again. Do you know why? Do you know how many Nami Schwans are in this series? The running gags are just basically catchphrases that are used again and again and again and again and again. And it's literally like running a joke into the ground. One Piece is funny every time it tries to be funny without resorting to these awful, awful lines. Everyone looks way too similar, especially the women. I'm going to list to you the three different types of female characters that Oda draws. There's the top heavy hourglass, there's the fat people, and then there's little girls. That's it. That's literally the character designs for every single female character in One Piece. How do people pick up abilities that simply don't follow the methods that the series sets up? Haki is great, and using your devil fruit to mastery levels and learning abilities uh, related to that is it's great, and I'm all for it. But when you have characters that learn abilities without doing anything, it takes all of the momentum out of Luffy taking two years out to learn Haki and stuff like that. 
Like Sanji is great and he doesn't have any abilities and yet after the time skip he can basically fly and he can also use fire for no reason apart from being quick. I think Oda said his spirit is fiery or some shit like, like come on man just give him just give him his San outfit and call it a day man. If Oda was gonna have Ace die and then give the flame flame fruit to Sabo then why make it a big part of Dressrosa to be about obtaining the fruit just to have Luffy be able to use Red Hawk anyway. Luffy doesn't have the flame flame fruit, and he never does, by the way. That is Sabo's fruit, and it's passed from Ace's ability to Sabo. Luffy can just use Red Hawk for no reason at all, apart from probably being quick or something. You know, actually, let me get that. Let me get that interview up now. Why can Luffy use Red Hawk? Oh my God, is there not an answer? The power of friendship. <laughs> yeah. So he's made out of rubber. So apparently, he uses friction by moving his arm very quickly. So basically, he creates fire. He sets himself on fire. Why is the filler in the anime relegated to flashbacks that swamp otherwise canon episodes? Naruto, despite being an anime that had crazy amounts of filler, at least did the canon well when it came time to adapt. But One Piece's anime does this annoying thing where they try to make every episode a canon episode, but to do that, they do it in such a way that you get about 5 minutes of canon and 15 minutes of flashbacks or cutaways or reaction shots stretched out. This was pretty much the entirety of the Reverie arc. I will say that they are making a lot of effort to make Wano cover two thirds of a chapter every episode, and it does make the pace quite a bit better, but until that point, it was ungodly, man. And the pacing overall for the show, oh my god, it is a sorry state of affairs. If you watch the show, please heavily consider watching one of the fan edits that pieces the canon material in the show together. It really is worth it, I promise you. But in all seriousness, the first point is probably the biggest source of controversy and discussion in this series. How long it will last. I wouldn't say that this undermines the story either, as established before, it's the core of One Piece's storytelling, and it definitely deserves criticism in parts. But overall, the real reason why this is the second to last chapter on our journey of analysis is simply because Despite these small bad moments that make you want to give up on a 1000 plus chapter series, the good moments genuinely outnumber and outshine them when all is said and done. Though this is a point separate enough to begin a new and final chapter as we look at the entirety of One Piece, good and bad, and determine why we should consider it genius even after some, again, really, really bad duds. Gravitas is this notion of solemnity, of sudden seriousness and maturity. It's kind of like what I was talking about with the spirit of Luffy and how that ties into the themes of the story, which then intersperses itself into how Oda writes for the other characters, and how this bleeding into other characters also lends itself to the story element of the Will of D, which passes itself on in a world tearing itself apart between order and chaos. The gravitas, the weight, of One Piece is only as good as it is because of the levity in its world, from the lovable characters to the innocent and flashy art style. Despite the fact that this series is one of the benchmarks of manga and definitely earned its way to the top, it would be absurd to say to somebody out there to commit this much time to something, let alone a series that starts out in such a standard way and takes so long to get started up. The height that a franchise can reach with a long form story like this is insane. There are so many characters and scenarios with amazing fights and tragic struggles, grandiose highs and horrific lows. The greatest strength of One Piece, that it gives itself the time to tell this story, is also its greatest weakness in that it takes too long to get started and too long in its moments of downtime. The genius of One Piece isn't visible until you have witnessed it for a long time yourself, because the series relies heavily on the passage of time both within the story and for pacing reasons in a leviathan of a series. One Piece is one of those series that are few and far between because its reliance upon the passage of time is gigantic. Oda has, as stated before, not mapped out a complete story in any way aside from an ending point. Because of this, the story is inherently one where the characters have to be the people to carry the story, and not one where the story drives the characters. The difference between these two, a story carried by the characters and one carried by the plot points themselves, is a stark one indeed. In a way, the characters need to be the ones to carry a story, because if events just transpire around the characters repeatedly, the characters eventually become cardboard cutouts, relegated to a reactionary role within a story that they have no choice but to be a part of. It makes things feel unnatural, characters feel unconvincing, and the whole story contrived. When the story is carried by the characters, we have a group of people with different relationships among each other, and one where the end path may be elongated, ended entirely, or reached faster than it should. 
The story is almost a plaything for these guys, and it allows for the path towards this story to be all the more captivating for it. That's a solid rationale for Oda's character writing, which is something we contextualized within chapters 1 and 2. With chapter 3, we surmised that a perpetual fluctuation was what held the structure of the series together, and so tight were these elements that chapter 4's focus on negative aspects didn't serve to dismantle a single one of them. So what have we got here? We have a plethora of astoundingly written characters in an irrefutably attractive world that has all moved onwards in a stimulatingly organised way. These three key points are the crux of this greatness and are what keeps so many people coming back week after week to a manga and an anime that have a devoted fan base even through other gems. As said before, it's an invisible thing to those just getting into One Piece, and I think that knowledge of this, for example, seeing this video before watching the series, doesn't impede on your enjoyment of the series one iota. In fact, I'd argue that it would strengthen the delivery of Oda's writing. To be able to sit back and embark upon this series by understanding that this is how the story works, it makes you want to watch weekly because you want to see the One Piece, obviously, but on the way, you're more excited to see things like Wano or Raftal or how on earth Luffy can take on the Four Yonko or the other attack moves that Luffy has learned in the two-year gap. There's the Void Century, the Shanks' abilities, there's the Revolutionary's plans, and there's the mystery of the world government overlord, Im. These are all plot points that serve almost as an endgame. And not even counting these, there's the character interactions that you want to see. Luffy and his father. What kind of dynamic do they have as father and son? What's the history of the two, and whatever happened to his mother? Will Sanji and the Vince Mooks ever settle their differences, and is that even possible? What about Luffy's adorable grandfather, Garp? How will their relationship change with his son trying to overthrow them, and his grandson hosting an entire fleet of the worst generation pirates? How about the worst generation? There's just so many characters and tantalizing storylines on the horizon, and it all truly takes on a tone of adventure that trumps anything else you can think of in the manga industry. All of the past points of discussion in this video, the characters, their backstories, and the structure continue to grow and improve the more and more that you consume. It's almost better that the beginning of the series was as gradual and lesser in quality, because it helps the series grow not only in scale from a storytelling perspective, but it helps pace your consumption on the level of a reader or watcher. The richness of everything in One Piece has had a 1,000 chapter ascent throughout the years, and we're now at this point where we're at the cusp of hundreds of alluring tidbits concluding together before the whole series comes to a close. Oda has stumbled upon a goldmine of storytelling opportunities by conjoining these three elements together. In doing so, One Piece has garnered a tender spot in the hearts of millions. I hope that you've enjoyed sharing these moments with me, and that I've captured some of the reasons why you will begin to see One Piece as genius. But apart from that, this is going to do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you in the next, and have a wonderful night.